Hello Black at USA 2021. Uh, today we're going to talk about MFA and the unMFAable, protecting off system core secrets. So thank you for being here. My name is Tal Beeri and I'm co-founder uh, for Zengo. And I'm uh, Matan Hamilis and I'm a cryptography researcher at Zengo. Okay, so Zengo is an easy and secure crypto experience, a mobile application uh, that you can download from uh, your mobile stores. And the special thing about Zengo, we are operating and putting to use some advanced cryptographic uh, protocols, uh, novel ones that are very much relevant to the topic of this uh, talk. And we'll show you how. So what are we going to talk about today? We'll start with Sunburst incident, give some context uh, to it, and then move quickly to the Golden Summer persistent attack. We'll start, don't worry if you don't know how someone works, we will talk about that, you will know how someone works, and then we'll talk about how attackers can abuse that uh, summon functionality to create the Golden Summer persistent attack. Then we'll talk about solving Golden Summer. We'll start with uh, detailing uh, the uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication, which we think is a good reference for a good solution. We will we'll show the current solution for the problem and tell, uh, talk about their limitation, and then suggest our novel solution based on that advanced cryptographic techniques that we use in our crypto wallet. Then Matan will show you our exact solution, including a demo, so stay for that, and we'll conclude with some takeaway and Q&A. So Sunburst, it seems like every year it has its flagship uh, breach, uh, security incident. So this year, this was Sunburst, and in Sunburst, and an advanced persistent threat, according to White House, Russian intelligence services targeted high-profile US Gov agency. While most focus on the advanced aspect of, the, of this attack, the A in APT, the supply chain compromise on uh, solar winds that gave the attack the, its name Sunburst, want to focus on another aspect of it, of it being persistent. So what does it mean persistence? Uh, we often think only of the attacker as persistent, this is the P in APT. However, often APT attackers meet APT target, advanced persistent target. Both sides are advanced, they have the budget, they have uh, the knowledge, and both sides are persistent. Uh, for all the foreseeable future, we can assume that uh, Russian services will continue to be interested in what uh, certain U.S. government agencies are doing, and the U.S. government agencies, the same one, are aware that uh, there are some attackers targeting them, but they need to keep on working and need to uh, find these intrusions and deflect them. And this game of cat and mouse goes on and on. The game is never over. Uh, so what does it mean for the attacker? They know from the get-go that they're going to be exposed, yet they need to return to the same target. And Mi Mitra defined this uh, persistence as a tactic. A uh, hierarchy that includes all kind of uh, uh, techniques. So persistent consists of techniques that adversaries use to keep access to system. And a popular way for attackers to maintain that persistence is by targeting the target's long-term secrets. So in the past was mostly single factor password uh, because attackers, uh, while they're uh, installing malware on the infected, on the victim environment, they try to grab also plain text password because they know that when they get discovered the malware will be wiped out it could be that the password will would remain so this enables them maybe to get access again because they can use the remote access of that company let's say they have VPN to get back or even if it's not possible once the attackers regain a foothold within that environment they are able to return quickly return to the assets that they once had the uh, access to and not start from uh, square one using this password. However, this uh, uh, attack vector was largely mitigated by the use of the multi-factor authentication. Again, it's not present in every victim, but we can assume that in advanced persistent target that they already 
uh, deployed MFA, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, this is no longer a valid uh, persistent method for the attacker. So they need to come up with something more sophisticated, and of course, because they're advanced and persistent, they do. Uh, so such, uh, so they target keys you that are used by the victim to generate access token. So. One example is the Kerberos KPTGT and the golden ticket attack. And another example that we are going to focus on today is the SAML private key and the golden SAML attack. So let's talk about golden SAML. And before we talk about golden SAML, we have to understand how SAML works. So modern uh, corporate environments are comprised of many web services served by different vendors. For example, we use GitHub for, to manage our code and we use Jira to manage our project and G Suite for email and so on and so forth. And each service has its own authentication solution, which creates a huge a headache for the IT and security department. Because let's say we have 20 different services, so for every new user, uh, IT has to, uh, to create 20 different accounts in every service, and then uh, create passwords. So do we create a unique password, or we reuse password, both options? It has their own limitation. What happens if we want to update someone, someone changed role or uh, got fired, etc. So it's a big headache. And in order to solve that uh, problem, uh, all organization w had to agree on a standard called SAML, which is Security Assertion Markup Language, that enables uh, to extract that functionality of user management out of the service providers, the SPs, for example, as we said, Jira, GitHub, uh, G Suite, and so on, and put it in a centralized place in an identity provider. And just to give you a test uh, of some analogies, I hope it will be helpful. Maybe you are aware as a user of the sign-in with functionality that uh, enables you, for example, instead of creating a new account in, uh, for a new service, you can just reuse your uh, credentials from, uh, from uh, Google and sign in with uh, Google or Facebook and so on. So this is, it's not the same standard, it's different standard, but kind of the same motivation. Or if you're coming from uh, IT security and on-prem security and IT, you can think of SAML as the web version of Kerberos. So I hope one of these analogies work for you, but if not, let's explain explicitly what is SAML. So let's uh, say we have someone configured, uh, and I'm, I use my uh, corporate email, tal at zengo.com, in order to log in to GitHub. So because of my IT administrator had already configured someone for uh, GitHub, then GitHub recognized that I'm coming from, uh, from Zengo based on my uh, domain, and instead of showing me uh, the password, uh, uh, text box, it, uh, it goes to the SAML definitions uh, that my IT administrator had pre-configured, also uh, pre-configured a public key that we'll talk about, and that now redirects my browser directly to my IDP, my identity provider. So in the identity provider, it can take uh, decisions about my authentication based on uh, the rules that the uh, IT administrator had created. For example, let's say GitHub is a very sensitive system, so I need to do a three-factor authentication. However, it sees that uh, I just connected uh, two minutes ago to Jira and performed that MFA, uh, the three-factor authentication, so maybe I can, it can be reused and I don't need to do it. Anyway, once I pass the uh, authentication phase, uh, the IDP generates a SAML token, which is a fancy name for XML with security assertion that we'll show you uh, some screenshots of it on the next slide. And it, it includes all kinds of details uh, about my name, my email, or, and the roles. Uh, I use everything that the SP is need, the service provider needs in order to uh, show me the site correctly. And then, the IDP signs the SAML with its private key to prove its authenticity, and we'll talk about that in detail in the rest of this uh, talk. Then send the SAML token to the user, or more exactly, uh, precisely, to my browser, and redirect me back to the SP, back to GitHub. 
Uh, so before I go to GitHub, I'll just show you some uh, XML examples or this, this summer, as you can see, it's an XML, some fields there. The upper screenshot is the signature and the lower part is some attributes on my user. For example, I'm a member and a student in uh, some system. And when GitHub, the service provider, gets back that uh, summer served by my browser, then it first verifies the signature based on the pre-configured public key of uh, my domain and then acts according to the security assertion. Let's say I'm a student and I'm a member. So in a high level, let's sum it up. A uh, SAML token can be likened to a permit and the IDP has a stamp and one is, once it stamps the, that permit, then uh, as a user, I can present it to my uh, SPs, my service providers, and get access to. And as we saw, like, w what enables SAML to do all its good stuff, it's the decoupling of removing some certain functionality out of SPs and putting it in, uh, in the IDP. That enables us single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, MFA, user details in one place, so it can be easily updatable. And also SP and IDP do not talk directly, only via the user browser. So again, less coupling, we can change each of them in a very easy way. And the only thing that glues SPs and IDP together is, is the keeper, the private key that is held in, uh, held in the IDP, and the, the private key in the IDP, and the public key in the service provider. So what happens if attacker steal the private key? So in one sentence, bad things happen, very bad things. So if attacker is able to uh, attack the IDP and steal the private key, now they become a rogue IDP and they can sign permits and stamp them however they want. So they can log into any service, uh, services that the victim is using, any SPs, as any role, as any user. But it's not just stopping there. It also, there are some more subtle advantages for the attacker in doing so. By doing so, they totally bypass the original IDP security policies. So they by, effectively, they bypass MFA and all of the fancy MFA we have to stop attackers are, not, are rendered pretty much useless because this permit uh, issuance happens after that stage. So uh, all these fancy UB keys, fingerprint scanning, useless to stop the attackers and also the compensating control such as uh, access monitoring uh, if we if as defenders we use the idp logs to see who connected to where when and find the anomalies there we wouldn't see the attacker activity at all there because it's done after the idp so the idp is completely blind to it so it adds stealthness to the attackers uh, attack and the term from this attack, uh, Golden Summer, was coined by CyberApp uh, almost four years ago. However, uh, Sunburst is the first publicly known use of the technique in the world. So let's move on to solving Golden Summer. Before we start solving, we have to be very crisp about the problem definition. We want to solve Golden Summer, which is a persistent technique. Want to solve the offline use of the IDP private key, in which attacker gets a time-limited access to the IDP, and but gets a long-term access to uh, victim services uh, by uh, creating some rogue SAML token with this private key. What is out of scope is so solving online attack on IDP. Uh, if uh, there is currently a malware on your IDP or attackers has has some hands-on keyboard on, on that. In fact, it's an easier problem that should be solved with our usual bag of tricks to treat this, such kind of problem. All kinds of endpoint security, XDR, process whitelist, and so on and so forth. And as lazy engineers, and, and the lazy engineer is a good engineer, when we are facing a new problem, we try to find like a, a reference for it, a good reference for it, a good solution that works. And as we saw earlier, MFA largely solved password as persistent mechanism. If we want, we can believe uh, Microsoft research that said it solves 99 percent, 99.9% of uh, account compromise with password. Or we can just take a look at APT action and see they are bothered enough with MFA that they need to find a way, some ways to bypass it. For example, Golden Summer. 
So what made MFA a good solution? We think there are four different elements. First is the composability. Password is no longer a single point of failure. Secondly, the orthogonality. The extra factors are actually different. If we, MFA was like, let's do, do two passwords or three passwords, it would be just more of the same and it wouldn't be effective. Scalability, because we know the attackers will keep coming back, we need a way to set the degree of difficulty and set it higher if we like. So MFA is not about a single factor. We can, as defenders, we can add multiple factors, multiple different factors. So if one additional is not enough, we can do two or three or change them. So this is scalability and also short-lived. The other factor, value keeps rotating. For example, if we take TOTP, like you have in Google Authenticator or uh, RSA Secure ID, then uh, this code, it changes every uh, 30 seconds. So even if attacker gets a hold of it, it gets access for 30 seconds and no more. So can we apply this MFA principle to solve the golden summer? Can we MFA the un-MFAable as the title of our talk says. But we f before we go into the, solu the good solution that we propose, let's uh, consider current solution. So CISA, the cybersecurity agency, uh, in their advisory about uh, detecting uh, such abuse directly uh, as a result of a sunburst attack, and their recommendation was to install an HSM and to say an HSM aggressively updated makes it very difficult for actors who have compromised the system to steal the private key and use them outside of the network. So in theory, HSM can solve that because SM, uh, HSM can sign uh, our SAML token, so it works, yet prevent direct access to the private key. There is no API to get, uh, to get the key. It's uh, buried in, in the hardware. In theory, attackers cannot uh, take that and use that in an offline manner. So let's grade that uh, solution based on the criteria we derived from MFA. So composability, private key is still a single point uh, of failure. And if attacker steals that from the hardware, they again become a rogue IDP and nothing uh, can stop them. Orthogonality. Well, does hardware residing in the same compromised environment as, uh, as the IDP provide enough resistance? Even CISA don't truly believe that. They say you have to aggressively update uh, your HSM system because advanced attackers living in the same environment as your HSM solution will see the HSM solution and probably will find vulnerabilities in, the, in that as uh, Ledger showed uh, in Black Hat just two years ago. Scalability, the solution does not scale. Uh, if we move the, uh, the secret, the private key from software to hardware, okay, this is a good step, but if, what if it's not enough? What would be our next step? Is there hardware? Well? Uh, I don't think so. So it's kind of one and done, and it's not suitable for this uh, cat and mouse games that we have between attackers and uh, defenders. And short-lived, still this is the same uh, private key uh, as before, so it's as long-lived as it was before. So it didn't help with that. So I would rate this solution as a barely passing uh, solution. It, it, it's, a, it's an improvement, but it's not where we want to be. So what would be an ideal solution? What if we can have multiple signers, where each token needs to be signed by multiple parties, and these parties will be orthogonal? For example, one is on the customer network and the other one in you know, a third party vendor that there is no access between this environment. Uh, so let's talk, uh, uh, examine that from the same success criteria we, d we defined. So composability, there is no single point of failure. Even if attacker uh, steals one of the private key, it does not have access to the others. Orthogonality, environments are totally orthogonal, they are not connected. Scalability, it scales. If, uh, one, if, if two parties are not enough, we can extend to three parties, four parties. We can set the degree of difficulty the way we want it. Short-lived, well, we didn't do much in that, but if it was the only problem, then this was a, would have been a good solution. However, there is a problem. And the problem is that, that change requires changes. So, of course, Changing requires changes. However, we want the changes to be limited only for the IDP. Why? Because in the IDP, 
we ha as defenders, we have a way to upgrade it. It only depends on us. So we can invest in the resources and we have the motivation to do so. However, if we change a from a single signer to multiple signers, it means we need to change the standard and more importantly, make every service provider respect this new version of the standard, which will take probably many years. So it's not a practical solution. So the question is, we have that great theoretical solution. Can we have that solution, but change only the IDP? And here comes uh, some, uh, with modern cryptography magic, with threshold signature scheme, TSS, we can do that. So in TSS, private key is created in a truly distributed manner and signing is done in a truly distributed manner. And when I say a truly distributed manner, what I mean, it means that we're not creating the key in one single place and then sending it, uh, splitting it and sending it to the multiple parties and when they need to sign, they send it back again and reunite because this wouldn't help. Because in, in certain point of time, the private key will be in one place and attacker can steal that from that, from that place. Truly distributed manner means that each party create their own secret, their own shell in uh, TSS lingo and never send it outside of that uh, environment. So uh, key, gen is truly, uh, key generation is truly distributed and also signing is done with some kind of interactive protocol between the parties that does not involve them to, uh, revealing the secrets to one another. And the magic here is although the, we change key generation and signing, the public in single verification remains the same. So we achieved our goal. We only need to upgrade the IDP to support TSS. However, SPs remains the same and we don't need to change nor, nor the, uh, the standard, neither the SPs implementation. And to explain how it's actually done in the cryptography level, TSS for ECDSA, which is the uh, elliptic curve digital sign signature algorithm that we use in SAML and also in uh, our cryptocurrency wallet. This would take a few more Black Hat uh, talks, so I included uh, some reference there for your future, for future reading, if you like. Uh, however, I wanted to uh, give you some taste, and this is inspired by the late Dan Kaminsky, so I want to mention him. He passed away just uh, a few months ago in April, and Dan Kaminsky was a prominent security researcher that most of you know, a lot of contribution to DNS security, also, but also Bitcoin security and other things, and Dan really loved load-bearing analogies and specifically the analogy that I'm going to present to you. So I hope it will be helpful for you and if not, well, this one is for you then. So let's talk about ECDLP, elliptic curve discrete, discrete log problem. Because every asymmetric crypto system requires a hard problem. What do we mean in hard problem? How to solve without a private key, the SK, easy to solve with the private key, and can be verified with the public key. So this is ideal for signing because if we uh, somehow tie our message to that uh, uh, hard problem, the signer can solve uh, the problem because they have the private key and everybody can verify that because they have the public key. However, no one else can solve that problem because they don't have the private key. And this problem is called the elliptic curve discrete log problem. And in uh, the formula for it is public key equals a uh, secret key cross product G, where G is a point on the curve. So let's try to give that intuition, that load bearing analogy. So Nick Sullivan from uh, uh, Cloudflare likened the uh, Crypt, uh, elliptic curve algebra to be a weird, bi a bizarre billiards game. Because as you see in the uh, GIF on the right hand side, uh, when we add point A to point B, it's like a billiards game in which we start, shoot the ball, put the ball on point A, shoot towards point B, and where it hits the curve, uh, it bounces back from the edges of this uh, billiards table of the elliptic curve, and where it hits the curve again, this is the result. And so we can think, so to take this analogy forward, ECDLP can be considered as a bizarre billiards game. The ball is placed on point G, and the ball is shot SK time, private key times, and ends on point P. And the hardness of the problem uh, assures us that no one can tell how many times the ball was shot, 
the secret key, SK, the private key, although everyone knows the starting point G and the end point P. So the question here is can we make it, this problem to be distributed? Can we have two players or three players uh, in this game? And the answer, we can make it a doubles game. So how will we make a bizarro uh, elliptic of a billiards game a doubles game? So we start as in before, the ball is placed on point G, the ball is shot SK1 times and ends on point uh, P1. So up until this point, it is exactly the same. Now enters the second player. The second, uh, because this is a hard problem, the second player cannot know what is SK1, although we see the starting point and the ending point. And then this player starts shooting from that point onward SK2 time. And as we can see in this formula, it actually comes down that uh, now the new public EP is actually equals SK1 times SK2 cost product uh, with uh, G, which effectively means that each uh, party, each player has their own private key. However, we have equivalent private key, private key uh, SK, that is the multiplication of SK1 and SK2. And I hope you are convinced the, or you have the intuition why ACDLP is still hard for multiple player. And we can get a very nice feature out of this uh, construction because now SK is not atomic, it's the multiplication of uh, these two shares, SK1 and SK2. So as defenders, we can change SK1, for example, multiply it by a factor of A, and multiply uh, the, second the second share SK2 by the inverse of it, and still maintain the same equivalent private key, and the same equivalent, of course, public key. However, the representation of the shares are changed. So if attackers uh, get a hold of SK1, uh, once we rotate, it's no longer valid uh, within the system. So the secrets become uh, short-lived. And how do we know that all of this works? And it's not just uh, you know, crypto theory. We know that because it's backed in into a product that is used by hundreds of thousands of users every day to send millions of dollar worth of cryptocurrency and we've been doing that for the last uh, three years and that enables our users to buy, store, trade and earn crypto in a tap so we know it works, we know it works well, we know it works securely and we know it's efficient and we had in the construction of uh, our wallet uh, because as you know uh, cryptocurrency requires uh, that, that each uh, you, uh, customer of the wallet has its own private key and so we create it in the TSS threshold signature way in which one share is created on the customer device and the other share is, is created on our own uh, server and we solve all the practical uh, solution around that and it worked perfectly for the last three years. So to sum up, summer flow, original summer flow is one stamp uh, on, on a permit that is uh, provided to service providers. Now with TSS we were able to distribute that stamp into multiple stamps. However, the result, the signatures looks the same to the outside world, to SP, so we can have multiple signers without changing the standard and without changing the SPs, only the IDP. So let's give a, a score to our solution. So composability, private key become decentralized and no longer a single point of failure. Orthogonality, each share resides on a totally different environment. Scalability, number of parties is scalable. If two are not enough for you, why not three or four? We can set the degree of difficulty the way we like it and short-lived because shares can be rotated without changing the main secret, they become short-lived. So this is indeed an excellent solution in the sense of the criteria we derived from MFA. So with that, I want to invite Matan to stay to show you the exact solution and the demo for it. So Matan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tal. Uh, so thank you, Tal, for uh, introducing the problem and the solution uh, for the problem. Uh, what I would like to do next is present you the actual demo that implements the suggested solution. Great, so the demo architecture is composed of three parts. Well, the first part is the identity provider, and the second part is the service provider that is agnostic practically to the TSS nature of the signature. And the last part will be our implementation of the threshold uh, signature for the ECDSA signature. 
Uh, great. So the first two parts we are just uh, were just taken out of the simple SAML PHP uh, project, which, uh, as its name suggests, just uh, implements the SAML protocol uh, with the PHP language. Um, great. So. What we contributed to its code base was supporting the ECDSA SHA-256 algorithm for the signature algorithm uh, XML uh, element in the IDP code base. Now, the handler for this uh, signature algorithm at the IDP calls for the multi-party signing routine when, uh, when uh, we try to generate a signature for the assertion. And the IDP and the SP will actually, in our demo, run in two different containers, uh, each running its own copy of the simple SAML PHP code base, each with its appropriate configuration. Great. So with that being said, uh, the next part is uh, the threshold signature ECDSA implementation, uh, implemented by uh, Zengo X uh, team on GitHub. You can uh, check it out. Uh, more specifically, we use the three out of three uh, signature scheme in our demo. And the signature scheme uh, used is uh, called uh, by after uh, Gennaro and Goldfeder, uh, known as a GG18. Uh, so in our demo, as said, each signer will, uh, in the th threshold uh, signature scheme, will run on a separate container. Uh, and each con one of those uh, containers of the co-signers is controlled by the IDP. The rest of them are assumed to be independent and thus uh, add value to the orthogonality uh, measure as mentioned by uh, Tal. Um, it's important to mention that while on the demo we run all the containers on the same PC, a real demo, a real world implementation of this uh, will compose different cosigners running in different orthogonal independent environments. So just that being said, uh, the demo actually includes also, the distributed key generation uh, as part of, uh, of our uh, code contribution. Great. Um, so the demo is composed of, th of two parts. The first part is the setup phase. Uh, and the second part will be an actual signing phase. So in the setup phase, we start all the signing uh, containers. Each of them will uh, take part in our distributed key generation algorithm for creating a three out of three uh, private key. Uh, for the ECDSA threshold signature scheme. Out of the generated uh, uh, public key, one of the, one of the co-signers will also generate an, a certificate uh, that will be automatically transferred to the service provider in our demo. So with that certificate, the service provider can actually verify the signed assertions being correct. Uh, great. So. This is just uh, like uh, the, the part of uh, explaining how the signing phase works in diagram. So the first uh, part of signing is uh, the user agent uh, requesting the service provider uh, a certain service. At this point, the service provider will discover an IDP. In our case, in our demo, what will happen is that the user will manually just pick an IDP, the single IDP in our demo. Uh, the second part will be redirecting the demo, uh, redirecting the user to uh, the single sign-on service, which is the IDP. When the user will be redirected to the IDP, uh, it will request the IDP to be uh, identified uh, and input some sort of credentials in a form given by the IDP. Uh, at that point, when the verification succeeds and uh, the, the IDP verifies that the credentials provided by the user are actually correct. Uh, a new uh, signature will be generated for the assertion that the user was verified alongside some of the attributes of that user. And at this point, the attributes will be returned back to the user uh, with the assert, uh, signed assertion, and the user will re be redirected back to the service provider, uh, giving him the uh, signed assertion and signing in to the uh, requested uh, service. Great, so let's take a look at our uh, demo. Um, great. I'll just turn that off. Great, so I'm just starting running the demo. And at this point, you can see that many of the um, containers are firing up. 
When they finish firing up, at the right side of the screen you will see three sub-windows, three panes. Uh, each of them is one of the co-signers. At the left side of the terminal you will see uh, an output of the certificate for the IDP, which will be moved later on to the service provider. Great, so the containers are up, and on the right side, as I said, you can see the three uh, co-signers. So if you take a look at what the first co-signer does, it basically uh, starts our key generation client, which distributively generates a private key, um, and send, sets up a, a server with which uh, all of the parties uh, communicate. Uh, this enables us to securely transfer uh, messages between the parties. As you can see, uh, we have three parties and a threshold of two, which means that we need more than two uh, co-signers to generate a signature. So this is the first co-signer joining the party, and down below you can see all the uh, transferred messages in the key generation algorithm. And when the key generation is done, we move to generating a certificate. And when this, uh, this certificate is later on moved to the service uh, provider. Great, so the second uh, co-signer does practically the same thing. Uh, it joins the uh, co-signing uh, event ceremony uh, with the uh, server and exchanges uh, multiple messages and gains its own share of the private key. And without going too much detail, the third co-signer does exactly the same. Great, if you take a look at the generated certificate, you can see multiple properties. Well, the first is uh, that the certificate is generated for IDP Zengo SAML, which is the domain of uh, our IDP. The certificate is generated for the ECDSA SHA-256 algorithm over the SECP-256K1 elliptic curve. Great. So, let's move into actually browsing our service provider, which is sp.zengo.saml. Since this is a self-signed certificate, we get this warning message. And this is our service provider. Great. So we press the authentication uh, tab. And we select our demo IDP. At this point, we are redirected to the IDP Zengo SAML website. We are given a form to input our credentials. We hit login, and when we'll hit login, you can see on the right that multiple co-signers will take part of the uh, signature generation algorithm. They all wait for an incoming message at this point. So let's hit login, and you can see them actually working on generating the signature. And when they're done, we are redirected back to the service provider with a message that notifies us of the success of our uh, login. And as you can see down the page, we have the assertion that was uh, generated by the IDP with uh, some of the attributes of the sign-in user, such as member and student. Great. So this is the end of our demo. Um, back to you, Tal. So uh, thank you, Matan. Yeah, you can stay, it's like uh, we have uh, two slides. <laughs> uh, so let's conclude with some uh, takeaways. So APTs are targeting long-term secrets for persistence. For example, Golden Summer, Advanced Persistent Target, Maso. Current hardware solutions are not perfect, as we showed, but using modern cryptography, TSS, threshold signature, with, together with, it's very important to know that with the relevant architecture, because Threshold signatures by themselves are not enough. We need to build also these orthogonal uh, vendors uh, that will be the parties in the TSS, in the distributed signing process. Uh, but to these two together enable much better solution. And I think there's even a greater lesson, more general lesson, that InfoSec should love cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency are solving high security problems and the InfoSec community should embrace that. And I think it was greatly expressed in a Dino Daizovi tweet about the importance of the security community 
community to take a look at what's on the, all the innovation that's happening in, in cryptocurrency project. So with that, we conclude. Uh, thank you for your time. And if you have questions, now is the time. Thank, thank you. you.